Hi, I'm Derek, and this is DC to Daylight, where we explore the world of electronics in the realm of DC, audio frequencies, RF, and into the visible spectrum of light. Well, actually, we're going to poke around in the invisible spectrum of light today where optocouplers exist, or optoisolators, or photocouplers. Well, no matter what you call them, the idea of an optocoupler is to optically transfer some information, whether it be analog or digital, from one circuit to another circuit while maintaining galvanic isolation between the two. That's a fancy way of saying the circuits are just electrically disconnected from each other, and we can transfer ones and zeros between the circuits using light. So we'll look at how to bias each side of the circuit, look at a few of the ancillary benefits of using optocouplers, and biasing for long-term reliability. So let's get right into it. Any type of optical coupling device utilizes some kind of light source, typically an LED in conjunction with a photosensitive device used as a detector. These two devices are physically separated by some short distance and provide electrical isolation, usually rated between three to 5,000 volts, though some specialized optocouplers can withstand voltage potentials of tens of thousands of volts. There are many different types of optocouplers, ranging from the simple LED phototransistor pair and the typical DIP package to multi-pin devices with specialized zero-crossing circuitry and Schmidt-triggered outputs. Now, optocouplers are useful when we want to isolate a potentially high voltage from a lower voltage circuit. Maybe safety standards require isolation, maybe we want to break a potential ground loop, or sometimes they're just useful to step logic voltages from one level to another. An application we'll look at in the next video is isolating a computer's I.O. from noise and potentially dangerous transient voltages present in a motor drive circuit. The earliest optocouplers used a lamp or LED in conjunction with a resistive photocell, sometimes called a light-dependent resistor or LDR. An example of this is the cadmium sulfide or CDS cell. Here we have our LDR or our CDS cell, and then uh, we have just a regular old white LED here. And with ambient room light, you can see it's about 3K. And if I try to completely black it out, which is impossible here, you know, we get around to uh, two megs, three megs. If it's completely dark, we can get up to like 10. And if I turn that LED on, you can see we get down to about 180 ohms and maybe by tweaking this LED, I can get it even lower. That is how a photosensitive LDR works. Now I could take that LDR and place it in a sealed tube with an LED and make my own optocoupler. And that's exactly what this guy is. This is called a Vactrel, introduced in 1967 by the company Vactec. The part number, if you're curious, is the VTL5C3. Simply an LED and CDS cell sealed in a light tight housing. I've got a 2K resistor here with 10 volts being supplied to it. It's currently off, but uh, that'll give me five milliamps of drive, which is kind of the sweet spot for this particular one. So three and a half megs with it off. Let's turn on that uh, LED. And you can see it dropped down to about 230 ohms. Now I think I could crank up the LED current a little bit and uh, I would drop down. I think the minimum for this uh, particular Vactrol is uh, five, five ohms. So there's some old school technology for you. Modern day optocouplers exclusively used LEDs as a transmitter, but as far as the detector, they could be photodiodes, phototransistors, silicon controlled rectifiers, triax, MOSFETs, you name it, and designers have probably done it. For the purposes of this video, we'll be focusing on the average everyday bipolar transistor. I have two types on my bench today, the Garden Variety 4N35, which has the transistor's base pin exposed to the outside world, and the PC817C by Panasonic, which does not have the base pin exposed. Now, we won't be manipulating the base pin in any way today, but just note that it can be biased in such a way to increase the transistor sensitivity or even aid in filtering out additional noise and transients by using RC components. So how much current do we need to put through the LED in order for the output phototransistor to turn completely on? So the LED side of things are pretty straightforward. A single resistor sets the LED drive current and that depends on our supply voltage. The transistor side of the circuit gets a little more complicated. We need to consider several things here. Number one, the optocoupler's current transfer ratio, or how much current flows through the collector emitter for a given LED current. Number two, typical operating temperature, ambient temperature. Number three, long-term LED degradation uh, due to drive current and duty cycle. First, we'll define some constraints that help us define two resistors in the circuit, one needed to drive the LED to an appropriate current value, and another to ensure the output transistor switches on and off to appropriate levels. The supply voltage to the LED will be at 10 volts DC, which is a nice value that I can use to demo on the bench. 
and the supply voltage at the transistor side will be 5 volts DC, common to microcontroller interface circuits like an Arduino. Now I need to choose a forward current to drive my LED with, and 5 milliamps is a decent middle of the road value that I'll choose arbitrarily for this demo. If we look at the data sheet for the PC817, we can see that the CTR or current transfer ratio varies but is 120% at an LED forward current of 5 milliamps. That means that if I drive the LED with 5 milliamps, I should get a collector current of 5 milliamps times 1.2 or 6 milliamps. Biasing the LED is no different than any other discrete LED. We can refer to the data sheet to determine the voltage drop of the LED at 5 milliamps. We can see that it is approximately 1.2 volts. If our supply voltage is 10 volts, our input resistor will drop 10 volts minus the 1.2 volts across the diode, and that comes out to 8.8 .8 volts. Using Ohm's law, we can determine the input resistor by voltage divided by current, which is 8.8 .8 volts divided by our 5 milliamps, and that's equal to 1.76 kiloohms. We can round up to the next actual value of 1.8K and be safe. Now let's move on to the transistor side of the optocoupler. With the transistor as a switch, we want to make sure that we fully saturate when the transistor is considered off. So we need to select the correct collector resistance. We do so by taking the collector current of 6 milliamps we calculated earlier and using Ohm's law, find the collector resistance. Our output side of the optocoupler is driving a 5 volt logic circuit. So we say 5 volts divided by our collector design current, 6 milliamps, and that's equal to 833 ohms. Recall that our collector design current is our LED forward current of 5 milliamps times the CTR of 120%. 833 is a non-standard value, so we're gonna round to 820 with a 100 ohm resistor in series, and we should be okay. Now there are a couple of other things we need to consider when it comes to current transfer ratio and how that affects long-term reliability. The data sheet will provide a curve for relative CTR versus ambient temperature. This will affect the previously calculated current transfer ratio, and usually as temperature increases, this will decrease the current transfer ratio, or CTR, to some percentage. For the PC817 we're using today, the CTR is 100% at room temperature, so nothing need be done here. Though if you were operating at 75 degrees C, for example, there's a relative CTR of 80%. So we would need to take our original CTR of 120 and multiply it by 80%, and we'd end up with a CTR of 96% then we'd have to recalculate the resistor in our collector circuit. Lastly, we need to consider CTR loss over time due to LED aging. Yep, LEDs will decrease their luminosity over hundreds of thousands of hours in operation. How to predict exactly how much this affects the current transfer ratio is difficult to quantify. It depends primarily on the drive current of the LED and duty cycle, which of course affects the temperature, which changes the luminosity. I haven't personally done testing over 10 to 30 years for any particular LED, but manufacturer literature suggests that the CTR could possibly decrease by as much as 20 to 25% when driven near the upper end of the LED's limit with 100% duty cycle over 30 years. So if you are designing a circuit for long-term reliability, you may want to factor this into your CTR calculations. Here's our final circuit. We've got our optocoupler here. We've got our LED input resistor of 1.8K going to the anode or pin one. And I'm driving the input of this resistor from a 10 volt uh, square wave and the cathode's connected to ground. On the collector side, we have our resistors that go to the positive rail, which is our five volt rail here. And the emitter is connected to ground. So I've completely isolated uh, this 10 volt side of the circuit from this five volt side of the circuit, okay? So if this were connected to like an industrial circuit that might be susceptible to noise or transients, this part of the circuit would be safe. So we'll be monitoring the output of this phototransistor on the collector side right before these resistors. And I've got my 74LS14 Schmidt trigger over here, okay? So that's gonna take this waveform. And if uh, I'm running the circuit too fast and it can't change state fast enough, this guy will square off the edges and we'll see that on the scope. So we'll look at pre and post Schmidt trigger to see what that looks like. So let me connect my probe here so we can monitor the input. I've got my output probe already connected to the collector and let's see what that looks like on the scope. All right, so in yellow, we have our input waveform at uh, 10 volts peak to peak. And let me turn on my power supply. And there's the output waveform of 5 volts peak to peak. This is before the Schmidt trigger. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. You can see that it's 180 degrees out of phase because we're dealing with uh, a common emitter uh, transistor circuit. And I'm going to zoom in and you can see how the rise time is affected by the capacitance inside of that optocoupler. So what I'm going to do is monitor the output of that Schmidt trigger and we'll see what that looks like. Let's compare the input versus the output to the Schmidt trigger. Turn channel one back on. Since the signal's inverted, it's kind of hard to show both at the same time, but you kind of get the idea. 
how gradual that turn on actually is if we zoom in. Uh, post Schmidt trigger, it's uh, actually pretty snappy. So we get the benefit with the Schmidt trigger of actually inverting the waveform back to what it originally was, and we get a fast turn on and turn off. That wraps up this episode on using optocouplers. Hopefully you found it useful. Um, I tend to use optocouplers quite often when I'm uh, interfacing to industrial equipment like robotics and stuff. Uh, it's usually around 24 volts and I'm interfacing to 5 volt or 3.3 volt circuitry. So these are calculations that I use quite often and you know, I hope you found them useful and give you the confidence to use them in your design. Uh, I'd love to hear about it if, you, if this was useful or if you use it in your own stuff. So let me know down in the comments and of course you can engage with me there and the Element 14 community. Links are below. That's it for me and I'll see you next time.